Greetings, everyone, and welcome back to uh, SCA Heraldry. I am Baron Mer Maddock Arundel. I am the current Cornelian Herald of Ethelmark, which is the assistant to the Kingdom Submissions Deputy, and I am also the Shrike Herald Extraordinaire, a uh, title given to me by the Kingdom of Kalantir following my tenure there as the Gold Falcon Principal Herald. Uh, this installment of our heraldic education series is called the Garnet Process. Garnet Herald is Ethelmark's uh, Kingdom uh, Submissions Deputy, and uh, I did uh, serve as the Garnet Herald uh, for approximately two years, uh, not too long ago, and I am in fact now the acting Garnet Herald as uh, Cornelian is Garnet's deputy, and Garnet is currently vacant. Uh, this class on the Garnet Process was a class that I offered at Ethel Mark's uh, Heralds and Scribes event uh, about three years ago. And uh, it was basically a class designed to uh, advise the uh, local uh, Shire and Baronial uh, participants as to what actually happens uh, after you or your client uh, throws those uh, submission forms and that check into the envelope and ships them off to uh, the Garnet office. So what happens after the consultation? Uh, this is particularly helpful uh, for local or consulting heralds uh, to uh, review as uh, frequently when a client gets a response from either the Garnet office or the uh, Laurel office at the SCA level. Um, if the news is uh, not good, if it's a return uh, for some reason, uh, or even if the uh, name and device or badge is registered, uh, it might be registered with minor changes or with some kind of uh, notation, such as an artist note or whatever, the client will turn to their consulting herald or to their local uh, person uh, with the questions, um, what does this mean? So. Uh, it's always good to be familiar as a consulting herald uh, with the Garnet process uh, so that you can explain it to your client uh, actually ahead of time, uh, set expectations, and of course answer uh, any questions they may have after the fact. So with that, let's take a look at what we're going to go over here. Um, the first thing uh, we'll look at is we're going to look at the forms. Uh, we're not going to talk about consulting uh, because I have other videos that address that. Uh, but we're going to look at the forms. We're going to look at uh, uh, collecting and forwarding payment. That's real quick, uh, just Ethelmark standard. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the internal commentary period, which culminates in a letter of report. A uh, letter of report is the uh, decision letter from the uh, Kingdom Submissions Deputy uh, that uh, discusses the disposition of uh, submissions that have appeared on internal letters. Uh, then we will look at the external commentary period, uh, which is when the kingdom forwards uh, those submissions to the Laurel uh, office in an effort to get them registered in the Society Armorial and Ordinary. Uh, and that period culminates in what's called a letter of acceptances and returns, or more commonly just LOAR. Uh, then we will take a brief look at what happens when problems arise in the uh, Garnet process and uh, things that you can do to mitigate uh, those issues. So with that, um, we have basically three different types of forms, uh, and the form is not designed by the Ethelmark uh, College of Heralds. It is actually designed by uh, the Laurel Office, and uh, it's a standard format that is used all across the SCA. Uh, what we here in Ethelmark are allowed to do is we're allowed to add our kingdom name here in the upper corner, and we're allowed to make small adjustments uh, to the footers uh, as far as uh, tracking um, for our internal tracking purposes. But the main body of the, of, of the form is going to be standard across the entire SCA. Um, and uh, uh, this one that you have here is what's called the name submission form. Uh, this is used for personal names. Uh, it's used for the names of shires or baronies, uh, the names of awards and orders, um, alternate persona names. Uh, anything having to do with a personal or non-personal name is going to go on the name submissions form. 
Um, and um, if you look over here on the right, you can see that uh, the, the four types of forms that we have, name, device, badge, and field list badge for individuals. We have those exact same forms uh, for SCA groups as well. The difference, and when I say group, I'm talking primarily about SCA official groups, shires, baronies, principalities, kingdoms. When a, when a group um, submits a, uh, a name and device, um, in many cases, a petition uh, must also be included in the package. Basically, a, a petition signed by a majority of the members of the group saying, yes, we want this for our name. Yes, we want this for our device uh, as a new Shire. Um, usually for things like order names or ward names um, and uh, uh, badges uh, that are associated with those, uh, the petitions are not required. But definitely for a group name and a group device, um, the, the petition is most likely required. Uh, when we talk about the forms, uh, we're going to talk about this in, in multiple segments. Uh, so we will talk about the header uh, information. Uh, we will talk about uh, the center part of the form here, which dictates uh, client preferences. And we'll talk about the providing of documentation. So this is what the header looks like on a device form. Um, and the headers are, are fairly similar across all, all forms, name, device, and badge. Um, they're all going to ask for your society name. And the reason for that is because all uh, the entire database at the College of Arms uh, is cataloged by your society name. Um, under our rules, every society name must be unique. No two people can have the same exact name. And so uh, because it is a unique identifier, it becomes one of the most obvious ways uh, to catalog anything associated with that name. Uh, but by the same token, we also need to be able to contact you. And so uh, the legal name and address, uh, phone number, email address are all uh, ways that we have to get in touch with you. Um, Consulting Herald uh, and a Herald's email or phone number. Um, if we have questions, uh, for the consulting herald as to, you know, what, what did you advise your client? What were you thinking, et cetera, et cetera. It's always good to have that contact information as well. And then of course we have all these little check boxes over here. And these check boxes are very important because they tell us on the Garnet staff what the status of this submission up is. And in this case, uh, this is a device submissions form. Uh, so this is the escutcheon or the shield shape that the device is going to be drawn in. Um, devices and badges cannot be registered unless there's a registered name. So we need to know if your name is already registered, if it is submitted along with this device uh, at the same time, or if it was previously submitted. Uh, so maybe it's on a letter that is still being considered uh, that but hasn't been registered yet. We need to have uh, that box checked and we need to know uh, if it was previously submitted, which kingdom, so we can look for it uh, in OSCAR. Um, OSCAR being the online system for commenting and response. We'll talk about that later. We need to know if this is a new submission, a resubmission, and if it is a resubmission, whether it was the kingdom or the Laurel office that, that previously returned the, the uh, submission. We need to know if it's a change, meaning you already have one registered and you want this to replace it. Um, if it is a change, do you want your old one released or do you want to retain it as a badge? We want to know if you're appealing a previously uh, made decision at either Kingdom or Laurel um, or other, meaning something, you know, anything that doesn't fit any of those. Uh, and you can see where it says attached justification because if you have an appeal, you're going to have to have uh, the reasons, the argument that you're making. Uh, attached to the form. But the head matter is very, very key because it tells us what you're doing and how to get in touch with you if we have a problem with it. Um, and that head matter, as I said, it doesn't really change. Uh, there are some additional uh, or slightly different blocks to be checked or some additional uh, information 
uh, that's asked for on one form or another. But for the most part, um, that's the information that, uh, that we need as a minimum uh, for any submission. Now on the name submission form, when you look at the bottom of the form or the middle of the form, um, you see what's called the, uh, 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 the preferences. So uh, when your client um, is thinking about, in this case, this is a name. Um, if your client is thinking about the name, um, we look for the check boxes here so that we can tell what the preferences are uh, if the name is at all questionable. So it asks uh, if the client will allow major or minor changes and you check the box when you will not allow changes. Um, major changes, uh, you would be surprised at what constitutes a major change. Uh, in many cases, um, the addition of uh, the word the in the middle of a name is considered a major change. So John Smith versus John the Smith, the addition or deletion of the word the is actually considered a major change. Uh, changes in language, uh, changes in grammatical form, um, uh, addition or subtraction of name elements, all those are considered major changes. Um, we will not accept major or minor changes to the name. Minor changes, um, correcting the spelling from an E to an A. Uh, correcting the spelling from two N's to a single N. Those are minor changes. Uh, capitalization. Uh, some people will submit, uh, they'll have like uh, uh, De Avignon and they'll capitalize the D in De Avignon um, when it should be lowercase. That's a minor change. Um, we highly uh, recommend that uh, clients leave the minor changes block unchecked. Uh, whether or not they check the major changes block. And the reason for that is um, if it's, if you will not allow any changes, if there's a problem, we're just going to send it back to you. If you allow minor changes, we're going to talk about what minor changes could clear the problem. And we're still going to call you because we have your phone number, email address, and street address here. We're still going to call you or email you, and we're going to ask you, hey, this, you, know, you have a problem. This is a change we can make that will clear the problem. Are you okay with that? Um, if you don't allow major or minor changes, then we're going to assume that the phone call is useless. We're going to uh, cut our losses, save ourselves time, and just send it back to you with an explanation. Um, in addition to major or minor changes, uh, we give you the opportunity to say what sort of changes you are comfortable with. So if the name must be changed, we care most about meaning, sound, spelling, or language and culture. Big thing here, if you check one of those blocks, tell us, under please specify, um, tell us what meaning, what sound, what spelling, or what language or culture you actually want to preserve. Uh, it looks really, really silly when we post stuff out on uh, Oscar and we say, um, meaning is most important to the client. And then uh, in parentheses afterwards, it says, no meaning provided. So it's very, very important to you, but you won't tell us what, what meaning you're looking for. And you might think that your last name translates to butcher when it really translates to mass murderer. And we could have fixed that if we'd have known that the meaning you were looking for was butcher rather than mass murderer. Um, optional. Um, and this is an opt-in where you're saying, here's the name I'm submitting, but I really want it to be authentic for 14th century France. So if you need to make any changes to make it uh, authentic for 14th century France, write 14th century France in there, and then please be specific. So select the option if you do not wish changes to your name, uh, or do not select this option if you do not wish changes to your name. Don't check these two boxes and then check these two boxes. If you want it authentic, 
check the box that says, I want it authentic for language or culture. I want it authentic for time period. You can check either one or both, but specify which language or culture, specify which time period you're looking for. Again, we're still gonna contact you before we send it um, up to Laurel to see if the form uh, that we've come up with uh, meets with your approval. This block here, left blank, name, documentation, and consultation notes. And you can fill this space, you can write on the back of the sheet, you can attach separate sheets of paper, all of that is good. Don't send it up blank. If you write a name, an SCA name in the top, and there is no name documentation and no notes about your discussion with your client in this block here, if I have enough time, I might go look for some quick documentation. I might poke around a little bit in Oscar to see if somebody else has a similar name and I can steal their docs. I might look in the two or three name books that I keep next to my uh, desk, but I'm not gonna put a lot of work into it. If it comes with no documentation and I can't off the top of my head say, that name comes from Rainey and Wilson. Grab Rainey and Wilson, find out it's on page 122. Uh, I'm gonna send it back to you and I'm gonna say returned, lack of documentation. So make sure at, at the very least, the website, the title of, uh, or, or the book, uh, title of the book, or the, the website URL, title of the article, um, the page, if it's in a book, the page it appears on, uh, if not, uh, roughly where it is on the website, three quarters of the way down, you know, on the left, something that leads me to where you found uh, your name so that I can do a write-up in Oscar justifying that name. On the escutcheon, we look for a lot of stuff here. This is for device submissions. The badge submission form is a square. And what we look for on the forms is we look for three things. Um, every form submission has to have a black and white line drawing. Okay, not pure black and white, an actual line drawing, vector art um, of the device or badge, plus a color copy of the device or badge. So the three things that we look for, um, we actually, four, I'm, I'm gonna say four things. First, we look to make sure that it's on the correct form. If you use an outdated form, uh, that is grounds for return. But uh, assuming that you've used the correct form, the three things we look for, does the line art match the color copy? And the easiest way to do this is draw the line art, um, Xerox it a number of times, and that way you can use the, uh, uh, the Xerox copy to color in as your color copy and you've got some spares around. But that's the easiest way to make certain that they, uh, that they match. Um, the second thing we look at, are the charges drawn correctly? Uh, are animals and plants in their uh, period form? Uh, are they in a recognizable posture or orientation? Uh, are ordinaries the appropriate size and location on the escutcheon? We're looking for the, um, the design issues, the technical design issues. And the third thing we're looking for is to make sure that the color copy uses actual heraldic colors. Um, for those of you that wanna know what those are, a box of Crayola markers, if you're coloring it by hand, if you're coloring it by computer, it's the 16-bit color wheel. Um, Actually, I could get away with the 8-bit color wheel. Um, we'll give you the most true heraldic colors. So um, those are the things we look for. And then on the badge, of course, um, when, we, uh, when we look at the badge form, one additional thing we look at, um, if you have charges here on the form and there's no color in the background of the uh, uh, of the charge, we're gonna to check to see, is it actually an Argent background or is it a fieldless badge? Um, so if it's a fieldless badge, of course, then we're checking to make sure that it meets the criteria for a fieldless badge uh, as well. 
And when I'm looking at these forms, I'm going to look at them to see if it is worth moving on with processing the, the submission. If there's a couple of minor flaws in any of this, if it's something I can fix quickly, um, I will do it. Um, if it's artwork, I'm going to call you and check first before I hand it off to a heraldic artist for a redraw. Uh, but if there's three or four problems with the form or with the submission itself, I'm probably just going to write down what the problems are, return the entire submission to you, and uh, have you rework it and send it back up. Uh, how do you know that your, uh, your artwork is correct? Penzig Traceable Art Project. Um, these are the uh, various line drawings of charges that the artistic staff at the Herald's uh, tent at Penzig use uh, to be able to draw uh, submission, uh, draw forms up for clients that are doing their submissions at, at uh, Herald's Point. I will give you a caveat. There are some patterns in the Penzig Traceable Art that are no longer used by the College of Arms, but they have not been removed from this database. Um, the most uh, common one is probably the uh, natural looking flame, uh, which was ruled uh, no longer registrable uh, as of a couple of years ago, um, but you will still be able to find it here in Penzik Traceable Art uh, under uh, flame and fire. Uh, so be a little bit cautious when going to the Penzik Traceable Art Project uh, for your artwork. Um, other places to look for artwork, uh, you can look at Mistholm, um, at the Pictorial Dictionary of Heraldry, affectionately known as the Pictic. Um, and that's, uh, uh, if you just type in, uh, go to Google and type in Pictic and uh, Mistholm, uh, it'll take you right to it. Uh, it's a very, very, uh, very, very widely used resource in the SCA College of Arms. Um, but you want to make sure that, uh, that you get the right size uh, for the charges, that you get the heraldic style, the medieval style uh, for the charges. And uh, this is a good resource for that. Um, once you have made sure that your forms are filled out correctly, that your artwork is uptight, um, the forms are going to go into an envelope. And you are going to mail the envelope along with payment to the College of Herald's Exchequer. Uh, and this information is currently posted on uh, the uh, AE Herald's website, so it is public domain. Uh, the check is made out to SCA PA Incorporated Ethelmark College of Heralds, and it's six dollars per element. So if you're sending me a name and a device, um, it's six dollars for the name, six dollars for the device, or twelve dollars total. Uh, so make sure that the check is written for the correct amount. Make sure that the check is made payable correctly. And then please, whatever you do, do not staple the paper. The don't staple the forms together. Don't staple the check to the forms. Um, paper clips are fine if you want to do that. And whatever else you do, do not mail cash. It's got to be a personal check or money order made out to SCAPA Inc., Ethelmark College of Heralds. Um, you, you can't have a check from the local shire. You can't have a check from, uh, you know, your friend Billy Bob uh, Thornton, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, the name on the check uh, needs to be uh, the name on the, on the submission, or at uh, the very least, a spouse or parent of the name on the submission. So you're going to mail the forms. You're also going to mail any documentation that you have. You're going to mail that payment. You're going to send it off to Bill Moore in Youngstown, Ohio, who is going to take um, your submission. He's going to verify that your check is good. Um, and if it is, he is then going to take your forms. He is going to scan them to create PDF copies of the forms. And he is going to email uh, the Garnet staff those PDF files. Right now, they all come to me. Um, I am then going to take those PDF files and I am going to convert them into 300 DPI JPEGs uh, because that is what the online system for commentary and response accepts into its database. Uh, 
and that is a uh, uh, shortcut for that is Oscar. So if you ever hear Harold's talking about Oscar, um, it's the online system for commentary and response. In order to upload your forms to Oscar, I have to have them in JPEG format. Uh, they have to be 300 DPI and they have to fit certain size requirements. And between Bill and I, we make sure that uh, those requirements are met. Now, once I have those forms converted into the proper size and uh, density of JPEG, I will log into Oscar, the online system for commentary and response. And I am going to create what's called an internal letter of intent. And I will tell you right now that uh, um, I have a separate class that I teach just on Oscar. Um, how to navigate through it and how it works. So I'm not going to go into a lot of detail uh, about how Oscar works in this presentation. But if you look up here in my drop down menu or down here on the uh, uh, sidebar menu, you see that I have uh, two links. One is called KLOIs and one is called LOIs. Now, when your submission comes up to Garnet and I, I get everything set up, I'm going to put your submission on a KLOI, also known as a Kingdom Letter of Intent or an Internal Letter of Intent. Um, I'm going to load up uh, all the information that I get off of the top of that form, and I'm going to load up all the information I get off of the bottom of that form, and I'm going to load up pictures of your armory and it's going to create uh, a presentation of your submission that other heralds in the known world can read. And uh, there's a certain period of time on the Kingdom Letter of Intent where heralds who are permitted access to the Kingdom Letters can comment on your submissions. Um, and for commenting, that means they may provide additional documentation. Uh, they may uh, do a conflict check and highlight any uh, conflicts or possible conflicts. They may discuss style. They may discuss heraldic uh, design or artwork. Um, they may discuss uh, whether or not uh, your submission meets the technical uh, rules of the administrative handbook. Um, whatever it is that they're going to discuss, <clears throat> the bottom line is that uh, on the Kingdom Letter of Intent, all of those comments are going to be taken into consideration by the Garnet staff um, in determining whether or not your submission is going to be returned to you or if it's going to be forwarded up to uh, Laurel for possible registration. Now, when Ethelmark uh, submits a Kingdom Letter of Intent, or an internal Letter of Intent, as it's shown here, I-L-O-I, um, generally speaking, we put it out for commentary for anywhere from three to four weeks. Uh, in the case of this one in my example, you can see it was posted October 10th, and commentary was going to last until November 10th. Um, and at the time I took this screenshot, it told me that the last comment had actually been posted on October 12th. So let's take a look at what an internal letter looks like. And here it is with the emails um, blotted out for privacy. Um, and Lucia Teresa de Courtenay happens to be my wife, which is one of the reasons I picked this particular screenshot. Uh, so here we have, um, we have Lucia Teresa de Courtenay, a new badge. And we have Rebecca White Bull, a new name and new device. And this is how, when I open up an internal letter of intent, this is how it appears on my screen. Uh, it will show the uh, text information over here to the left, uh, who the submitter is, what is their submission, new badge. Um, Oscar tells me that Lucia Teresa de Courtenay is, in fact, a registered name, so the armory can go forward because it requires a registered name in order to register Armory. And then it gives me the uh, blazon for the proposal. Fieldless on a mullet purpore, a Lark Volant Argent. Then over here on the right, 
you can see my line art, my black and white vector image, and then my color copy um, colored in with computer technology. And then this kind of oddball looking one over here, this is what's called the Oscar color corrected copy. And you can see that I did not actually use a heraldic purple on the submission form. Uh, it's kind of a plum color. What Oscar will do is it will read the colors on that particular submission and it will color correct them to what it perceives to be the uh, heraldically correct colors. And it's basically just a comparison uh, between the two uh, versions. Um, if this were to come up as blue or black on the color corrected copy, uh, that would be a clue that the color that was used over here uh, is probably not suitable uh, for electronic uh, filing and therefore uh, might have to be sent back for a redraw. Uh, but it came through as purple on the star and white on the bird, so all is good. Um, now down here, this is what's called the head matter. Um, and in the head matter, um, it will be anything that I took off of the form that I felt needed to be included in this submission. So the herald of record was me. Uh, the badge takes elements from the client's registered device, pure poor, a lark volant, and chief formal, it's in fess sergeant. And then you can, and, and not much else to say. I mean, it's a badge submission. Uh, but then somebody had left a comment here. So I herald by the name of Yago Op Adam um, on October 10th of 2017 at 11.02 in the morning. Um, apparently did a conflict check and did not find a conflict. So he came in here and he made a comment that says no conflicts found. Um, if you look at Rebecca White Bull, um, same thing. Now here, this is line art. This is actually a black and white copy. Um, there are cases where a black and white copy is allowed to have um, the black as actual black. Um, we don't recommend it, uh, but uh, there are people that are pulling clip art uh, electronically that's already pre-colored. Uh, so if it is a black part of the, uh, of the device, you, you can actually leave it black in the black and white copy. Uh, but we don't want to take the color copy and make a black and white Xerox of it because like in this case, these green roses would come out a shade of gray and that would be grounds for return. So we have the black and white copy, we have the color copy, and then we have the color corrected copy by Oscar. And you can see on the color corrected copy here, the roses lose quite a bit of detail um, and the color is faded out on the um, winged cat, um, indicating that uh, the color copy may not be sufficient for electronic filing and therefore not sufficient for electronic registration. Now, as it turns out, this went through uh, without any trouble. Um, but um, when Oscar gives you this kind of result, uh, you may, in fact, as Garnet Herald, want to go back and just trace over the detail in those roses with a darker pen. And you can see where the color scan is kind of washed out here. Maybe do a second scan uh, with a different setting on your scanner. Uh, but this is what an entry in an internal letter looks like. And um, at the end of that three to four week comment period, the Garnet staff gets together. There's about half a dozen of us. Um, and we pull up that letter of, of intent and we look at all of the comments one by one. We just go down the, the numbered list of, of submissions and we look at all the comments and we discuss uh, which comments are valid. Uh, we look, if somebody has highlighted a conflict, we might look for uh, a resolution. If somebody is questioning uh, whether something uh, in the submission is valid, uh, we may go looking for precedence uh, to determine um, you know, in this case, somebody actually said, can we use a star on a fieldless badge? Isn't a star considered uh, an independent display of heraldry? And it turns out that it, it is, but in like the 19th century. Uh, so um, 
but we had to go look that up. So uh, when somebody made the comment, A isn't a star uh, against the rules uh, on fieldless badges, we went and looked it up. No, stars are actually perfectly fine. Um, so we, we argue through all these points, um, and it doesn't take more than, uh, I mean, one of the worst ones uh, that I had uh, ran almost half an hour in discussion. Uh, we, we actually had an artist doing a redraw uh, while we were in the meeting. Um, most of them, it's, it's a few minutes of discussion, uh, a few more minutes if we have to go look something up. Uh, we might go, uh, we can go very quickly if there's no controversy. It's like, eh, John Smith, you know, Argent, uh, uh, a lion rampant sable. Yeah, looks good, no conflicts next. Um, but, but your average device uh, or name submission, we're gonna look at for, for a couple of minutes. And we're gonna determine right then and there, is this suitable uh, to go up to the Laurel level for registration? And if it is, then the second question is, can it go as is or do I need to make changes? Do I need to, to do a redraw? Do I need to uh, correct grammar or spelling on the name? Do I need to change uh, my documentation, either providing additional documentation or changing the format that the documentation appears in? Um, can I leave it as is or is there a change that I need to make? And in many cases, uh, I will borrow uh, documentation. Uh, other heralds will actually provide documentation in their commentary and I will copy and paste that uh, into the external letter. Um, I may rewrite it. I may explain something. For instance, uh, if we have a device that some people find questionable and other people don't, um, and we elect to send it up, uh, I may include in the head matter uh, several commenters during internal commentary had an issue with um, the last name of death uh, coupled with a winged skull uh, on the device. Um, you know, we, we believe that uh, uh, it's perfectly acceptable as the individual is not otherwise making a claim to supernatural powers. So we may, uh, if, if, if several people make a similar comment, we may add an explanation as to why um, we did not incorporate uh, that commentary into our decision. So then uh, before we send anything up to Laurel, uh, there are two things that we have to do. And the first thing is I document all of the decisions made in that internal decision meeting. And I publish it in what's called a letter of report. So if you look at this letter of report, you can see that here, um, Alexia Cavalieri had submitted a new device, what the description of the device was, and then an explanation submitted as Sable in pale, a Pegasus rampant to Dexter and a rapier festwise argent between two flaunches ermine. Commenters determined that the size and placement of the rapier made it a secondary charge, therefore we changed the blazon. And the blazon was changed to Sable, a Pegasus segregant, and in base, a rapier festwise argent between two flaunches ermine. Um, that that blazon was actually further changed when it went external, but that's another story. Um, so we, we give you um, the person, what they submitted, like Aline Naughty here submitted a new name and a new device. So the new name was obviously Aline Naughty, uh, and the new device was Jules Mariner's Astrolabe, not a chief argent of Bat Sable. And if, if it was anything other than a straight looks good, uh, a brief explanation of uh, anything that we corrected or, or changed uh, before sending that device or name forward. Uh, further down on the letter of report, uh, this is uh, top half is the following submissions have been forwarded to Laurel. Uh, below, there's a separate section. The following submissions have been uh, pended uh, because we're, maybe we asked the a client to uh, submit additional justification, like they want to use their mundane name and we need to see a copy of their driver's license. So we pend the submission until we can see a copy of their driver's license. Um, 
or if it got sent back to the client outright because there were just too many problems uh, for us to fix at our level. Um, so there's a section on that as well. And these letters are then posted uh, at the aeherald's.net uh, website uh, so that uh, anybody can actually go and uh, look for the letter of report that includes their submissions and find out what their disposition was. Now, in addition to publishing the letter of report, I actually also email each individual client um, the uh, commentary uh, that appears in the letter of report. So Alexia Cavalieri got an email that said, I'm very pleased to let you know that your device is being forwarded to Laurel for possible registration. Uh, it, it was submitted as this. We changed the wording because the sword was too small um, to be a co-primary. Um, if you have any questions, you know, let me know. Um, and I will courtesy copy the Consulting Herald's email on that notification. Uh, I used to do snail mail notifications uh, through the U.S. Postal Service. I no longer do those. Um, if your email address is missing or doesn't work, I will call you on the phone or find you on Facebook. Um, but uh, that letter of report uh, is strictly the internal decision processing. The second thing I do then is I take everything off of that internal letter that is going to go to Laurel and I transfer it to an LOI, letter of intent, also known as an ELOI for external letter of intent or an XLOI for external letter of intent. Um, and um, the Q in Oscar for um, LOIs, ELOIs, looks almost the same as the Q for Kingdom LOIs. There are some differences. You'll notice here on Kingdom LOIs, um, it's Kingdom LOI, here's the date, finishes commentary here, last comment, and this date time. It's kind of all crammed together in one line. It's a little bit tidier here on the external LOIs where it actually has everything in nice, neat little columns. Um, and it tells me um, uh, the date that the letter was finalized when it was published to Oscar. Uh, the issue date and the date finalized don't always have to be the same because I can actually go into the head matter of my letter and I can actually change the issue date. So if I put a letter out on the 1st of May, I can actually backdate it to the 30th of April um, and it'll show date finalized 1 May, uh, but issued uh, April 30th. It'll tell me the information on uh, when commentary was made and um, uh, how long that letter is available uh, for comment. So when I look at that, you'll notice there's a slightly different look to it, um, particularly in this case, the background color. Um, I actually have it set up so that uh, uh, the background color displays differently for the internal letters so that I don't have to think, am I looking at an internal or an external letter? Um, but the layout is sort of similar. So on this one, uh, you know, greetings to everybody who's above me in the chain of command. Um, this is Ethel Mark number 196, external letter of intent. It's our intent to register these submissions. And then the items, again, numbered. Uh, who it is, uh, what they're submitting, uh, and ex uh, the explanation. So in this case, uh, Oscar finds the name registered and we're submitting it with this blazon. Um, I've got the email blanked out, of course. Herald of Record, a Symphorian de, I'm going to mispronounce it, but I think it's Tabit Weaver. Um, and then you see we added the little head matter there. There was much discussion in the internal letter as to whether or not these charges were Crow primary and as to the position of the Pegasus. We acknowledge that the Pegasus is primary with the rapier secondary and have proposed the blazon accordingly. So we're explaining that we changed the blazon, but we didn't actually change the M blazon. Additionally, although the Pegasus is placed fairly high, because it crosses the fest line and because it is placed to maximize the available field, 
we believe it's acceptably drawn. So what we've said is, um, yes, this uh, it was submitted with the Pegasus and the sword as being of equal uh, value heraldically. Uh, we have decided that they are not. The Pegasus is visually much larger and should actually be centered on the field. But because of the way the Pegasus takes up that space, uh, we believe that this is an acceptable drawing. And we have noted that in our explanation here to avoid getting comments along the lines of, hey, your Pegasus is too high. Um, now, if you look down here, you can see device comments. Uh, Gopher Herald is a look away. It's currently drawn. The ermines are not evenly spaced. So commenting on the spread of the ermine spots um, here on the uh, flaunches. Uh, and then CSTAG, another herald, actually asked the question, uh, do they need to be? Is there any requirement in the rule book? And that discussion actually continued on uh, down that, uh, that submission as to whether or not the ermine spots were large enough, uh, whether there were too many or too few, uh, and whether or not they needed to be evenly spaced on, on the flaunches. And all of that commentary um, took place uh, and the Laurel staff is going to use it to make their ruling in the same way that the Garnet staff used it to make their ruling on internal commentary. Once, uh, and it's a two month period of time for Laurel uh, to make their decisions. So it's out there for about 60 days. Um, once that commentary period is over, um, the Reef and Pelican uh, sovereigns will schedule their meetings. Wreath is responsible for all armory submissions, Pelican for all name submissions, and Laurel oversees both. Um, they will schedule those meetings far enough out that their staffs, which are much larger than mine, have an opportunity to review all of the commentary, look up any appropriate references, and uh, uh, verify any claims uh, made in the documentation. Um, make sure that it's correct. Um, they then, of course, they have a meeting. They have to consider all 20 plus kingdoms and principalities out there. Um, if every one of them is putting out a letter every month, that's 20 odd letters every month. <coughs> Each letter can have up to 50 submission items on it. So uh, you're talking about a thousand elements uh, every month. So Pelican meetings and wreath meetings uh, generally take many, many hours, um, after which all of the notes must be uh, proofread, edited, and turned into a letter called the Letter of Acceptances and Returns. Uh, that letter will list every submission by kingdom, whether it's accepted, appended, or returned, and any notes uh, that go along with that, uh, whether it's uh, an artist's note uh, to draw something slightly larger or smaller, uh, whether it's a nice name comment, um, which is actually uh, pretty cool to get. Um, all of the notes uh, that are considered relevant will be in the LOAR. That is then sent uh, around a second time uh, for proofreading uh, before being published. So uh, two months of commentary. Uh, uh, two to three weeks of administrative work uh, on the uh, letters of intent, um, a couple of really long meetings, and uh, then two to three weeks of uh, more administrative uh, construction of the LOAR, uh, followed by a week of proofreading, three to four months before you actually see the LOAR. And in this particular one, you can see that uh, this is the Ethelmark acceptances. Uh, there is a link there to go to the Ethelmark returns, the Ethelmark pens. So the following items have been registered. Elena McLeland, device, and it gives a description. Allison Motherwell, name and device. Obviously, the name is Allison Motherwell and the device, there's a description. Benedict Sutton, name only. Got a comment. Nice, late 16th century English name. So he got a commentary. Benedict Sutton is to be congratulated. Uh, Cadwallon de Sancto Germano, name and device, description of the device. And then submitted as Cadwallon 
whatever go uh, without the D, Sanctus Germanus. No evidence could be found for unmarked locative bynames in Latin. We've changed the name to Cadwallon De Sancto Germano uh, to follow the attested pattern and to use correct Latin grammar. So, uh, and then the given name Cadwallon was not documented. There's a note there about that as well. So the fact that they changed it from what was submitted to what was passed, and I will tell you what happened here is I actually got an email from the Pelican Sovereign of Arms saying, hey, Matic, can you check with the client? And um, we need to make this change. Can you check with the client to see if that change is OK? And when she's asking me that, she's asking me that in the few days that they're working admin before their name meeting. Uh, so if I get hold of you and I go, hey, Pelican wants to know if this is OK, um, hopefully you're checking your email every day because uh, on a on a good month, I've probably got about three days to get an answer and get back to Pelican, or um, the name will most likely get get returned. But in this case, I contacted Cadwallon. Cadwallon said, "Yeah, that's fine." I contacted Pelican and said, "Client's good with it," and it showed up on a letter with an explanation of the change that was made. And that will keep going down all the way through all the acceptances, and then it will start on the next A kingdom, uh, which I believe is uh, on tier. Uh, Eld no, Eldamir is an E kingdom. Um, in any case, uh, uh, it uh, might be on Stiora. Might be on Stiora. Um, it goes by the kingdoms in alphabetic order, and because we got uh, an Esh on the front of our uh, our name, we we come first. Um, I will then go down to the returns and the pens, and I will look for those as well, because guess what? Laurel doesn't send out individual notifications to the clients. Laurel will announce to me that the LOAR is published. Um, I will go to the website where it's published. I will pull it open, and I will be reading exactly what you're seeing here. And then I will go back to the submission sheet from Elena McLeland, find Elena McLeland's email address, and send her an email saying, congratulations, your device, Jules Chepe Pelier, a domestic cat sergeant regard on Argent, and a chief in battle, Jules, has been registered by the Laurel Sovereign of Arms. If you have any questions, let me know. And I will do the same for every acceptance, every return, and every pend. Administrative issues. These are the problems the Garnet staff faces. If information is missing on the forms and it's something we need, you already have a device registered, you have submitted a new device, what do you want done with your old one? Do you want it turned into a badge or do you want it uh, released? You didn't check the box. We have to call you or email you and get your preference or we can't send it forward. Anything missing that we absolutely have to have. If if we need to contact you and there's no uh, email address or phone number and there's no street address, or I got a form last month, had a street address, didn't have a city, state, or zip code. Um, and it was from a, a, a barony. So baronies generally cover, uh, I couldn't even look up the Shire and see what town the Shire was in. Um, baronies generally cover large areas with multiple uh, multiple zip codes. So fill in as much information on the forms as possible. Um, if information is missing, it makes my job harder. And if it's something vital and you do not respond, it makes your job harder. Uh, don't use outdated forms. If it's on, a, on an outdated form, I'm going to send it back to you and go, hey, you need to download the current form and transcribe the information. I will not do that for you. Uh, failure to include the populist petitions on group submissions. If you're a new Shire submitting a name and a device for that Shire, make sure you include the group submissions. If you have a question as to whether or not a group submission is required, email the Garnet Herald and ask the question. Much better than having it get all the way here, missing a, a petition, and then you have to go back in and start over. Uh, missing payments or payments not matching what's in the packet. 
if you submit a name and device and the check is for six bucks, it's coming back to you. If your name is John Smith and the name on the check is Jim Jones, it's coming back to you. If you send cash, it's probably coming back to you. Um, that's not handled by me. That's actually handled by the College of Arms Exchequer. And while the College of Arms Exchequer does report to me on the status of submissions and um, uh, financial matters dealing with the Laurel Sovereign of Arms, um, they don't work for me. Uh, they don't. They they report to me. They report to the Kingdom Herald, but they don't work for us. They work for the Kingdom Exchequer, and in turn for the Society Exchequer. So they're following the Exchequer rules, not the Herald's rules. Uh, we talked earlier about boxes checked without explanation. If you check any boxes on the form look to see if there's a spot for you to, to fill in an explanation. Um, if not, we have to take time to contact you to get clarification. If it's armory and there's an artistic issue, the black and white form, the line drawing, has to exactly match the outline that's on the color copy. Um, I've had clients who have uh, submitted a color copy. I tell them, hey, I need the uh, I need a black and white copy as well. They throw down the color copy and they try to trace it and they do a, a poor job. They don't line up, they don't match. It's coming back for a redraw. Um, I tell them I, uh, uh, I need a black and white copy and they throw the color copy on the copier and hit the black and white copy button and it comes out shades of gray. It's coming back to you. It's gotta be line art and it's gotta match. Uh, charges not drawn in a period style. Modern aesthetics, particularly as pertains to animals and plants, um, people like to draw the modern versions or something that, quote, looks pretty, unquote. Uh, if it's not drawn in period style, I might have time to get one of my artists to redo it. Um, or I might have three or four that I'm already working on and I'm gonna send it back to you uh, for you to cover. Um, not using the heraldic version of colors. I will try as best I can to modify your submission sheet in uh, my Photoshop tool, which is not Photoshop, it's a, it's a knockoff. Uh, it's called Print Shop Pro. Um, I will try my darndest to turn your yellow highlighter into a heraldic yellow. I cannot promise it'll work. One, because my software is limited. Two, because I am not an artist. If I can't fix it, it's coming back to you for a redraw. Uh, quaternary charges is uh, the fourth layer. Uh, so you have your field, you have your primary charges, you have your secondary charges. Uh, sorry, you have your field, you have your primary charges, your secondary charges, your tertiaries, which are charges that are on top of primaries or secondaries. And then sometimes you have a quaternary charge, which is a charge on top of a tertiary. Um, only allowed in certain very limited cases. Usually that's an augmentation of arms. Um, and even then, um, strictly on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, if you have a quaternary charge, uh, if you have a, a rondel, charged with a horse, charged on the flank with a fleur-de-lis, it's coming back to you. Um, voiding and fimbriation. Um, voiding is where you hollow out the center of a charge. Fimbriation is where you'd use a thick outline around a charge in a different color. Um, both of them are, are valid heraldic designs, but they're also very limited in application. Uh, for both voiding and fimbriation, uh, only very simple charges can be voided or fimbriated. And uh, even with the simple charges, uh, it cannot be a peripheral charge, uh, such as a chief, a base, or a flaunch. Uh, you cannot fimbriate those. So um, you can't void those. Um, so if it's improper use of voiding or fimbriation, and it's not something we can fix um, through creative blazoning, it's going to come back to you. 
Uh, documentation issues. Uh, primarily, we see this with names. Uh, the name comes in and there's no documentation at all. Um, or the name comes in and you've documented the name Henry, but you've submitted the name Harold. Um, or you've documented a spelling of a name. Um, maybe you've documented uh, uh, Monticelli as M-O-N-T-E-C-E-L-L-I, uh, but you're spelling it uh, in your name submission as M-O-N-T-T-I-C-I-L-L-O, -L -L um, Monticello. Um, you've documented one spelling, you've submitted a different one, they don't match. If I can't find it within a few minutes, if I can't locate proper documentation, it's coming back to you. Um, if your documentation is from a published source, like a book, a magazine, or a uh, paper article, if it's not a book that is listed on the no copy list at heraldry.sca.org, which is a list of books that you don't have to provide Xerox copies because every Herald owns one. If it's not there, you have to provide scanned pages from the book. You have to have the title page of the book, the declarations page of the book, and the page on which the actual documentation occurs. If it's a website, you have to have the web URL, not to the front page, not to the home page, it has to be to the exact page on the website where the name element appears or where the picture of the artwork appears for uh, armorial documentation. Um, if you are doing an individually attested pattern and you have done it incompletely, you have not supplied a sufficient number of examples in accordance with the rules on IAPs, um, or you documented, uh, you forgot to document one element because in an IAP, um, you don't just document the anomaly, you have to document every element and design factor in the submission um, to the same time period and geographical re region. Uh, so if you're missing documentation of one part of the submission or uh, you needed three examples and you only supplied two um, or um, the, uh, or the documentation that you supplied isn't valid because it comes from an undated or unvetted uh, source. Um, I'm not going to do your IAP for you. It's coming back. Lastly, style issues. Uh, constructed name grammar. It is possible to use names that were not used in period. If you use period grammar to construct the name, from period name elements. Um, I actually have one that's uh, uh, going out this week where both the first name and the surname, sorry, the given name and the surname are both constructed names, but they are constructed from elements that have been used by other names uh, in period. And so we've documented the elements and we've put them together in what we think uh, is grammatically correct. Um, I don't speak Old Norse. So we are asking in our internal letter of intent if some of the Norse uh, experts out in um, the known world can assist us with making sure that that name is constructed properly. Um, if it's obtrusively modern, uh, we had a submission where somebody wanted to register the name of a household as crew of the serenity. And uh, that by itself would not have been obtrusively modern, but the badge they wanted to register with it included a leaf with a spear through it. Uh, if you do not get the reference, you're not a fan of the uh, TV show Firefly uh, or the companion movie Serenity, uh, but it's a, an overtly modern reference to a science fiction film. Um, the number of times that we've seen people try to uh, submit the Green Lantern logo or uh, Deadpool's uh, mask. Um, it's, that's a style issue that's probably not going to make it through. Uh, if it's overly naturalistic, um, easiest way to say that is if it looks like it's a painting of a photograph, um, it's probably overly naturalistic. 
uh, we call it landscaping, and uh, it is uh, it's a high bar to get pegged for landscaping, um, but I have seen it happen uh, enough. Uh, if it's overly cartoonish, uh, if you want Bill the Cat being run over by a car on your device, don't submit an image of Bill the Cat. Submit an image of a heraldically correct feline spread eagled on the on the shield with two sable pallets overall. Um, and if it gets registered, you can make your banner any way you want to. But if your submission is overly cartoonish, uh, we'll come back. Barely overall, um, heralds understand that what overall charges are. Uh, the big thing is because an overall charge is judged against the field, most of the charge needs to actually be laying on the field, not on top of the underlying charges. Couple last words, and this is the last slide. So, one, even if you are a herald, use a consulting herald when putting together your submission for yourself. Lawyers try not to represent themselves in court. Doctors don't operate on themselves in the hospital. Heralds should not assume that they are unbiased as they build their name and device submissions uh, or their badge submissions and push them forward. So even if you don't use a consulting herald, make sure you run your submission past one or two other heralds who aren't you um, to uh, check for any of the issues that we've talked about. Double check the forms, double check the documentation. Um, I, I will tell you that, that lack of proper name documentation is my single biggest headache um, as a member of Garnet staff. Uh, don't try to tell your life story, either in your name construct or in the number of charges that you put on your device. Um, canting arms are very popular in the College of Heralds. Uh, if you can come up with an unusual or imaginative way to uh, cant your arms uh, or your badge against your, your registered name, uh, we will get a giggle out of it, especially if it's an obscure cant. And we will definitely uh, uh, share your imaginative and brilliant uh, accomplishment with the College of Arms as, uh, as a whole. Uh, remember that uh, your Kingdom Garnet staff is here to help. And you can reach us at the email address on file at aeheralds.net. Um, however, also keep in mind that there is a local herald, uh, probably. Uh, every barony has one, uh, about half the shires in the kingdom do. There is also a regional herald. Uh, so each region has a senior herald uh, who is available to assist in any aspect of heraldry, including the submissions process. There is a uh, kingdom deputy herald who is specifically uh, set up to do uh, consultations online, uh, either through video chat uh, or uh, through email or social media uh, to actually uh, assist you with consultations if you don't have a local herald. Uh, there are some other um, avenues out there. Facebook has an SCA unofficial heraldry chat which is a great place to go for assistance uh, with uh, documentation and heraldic art. Um, but uh, assuming that you were, you're the Shire Herald uh, or the Consulting Herald, um, before jumping straight to the Kingdom uh, Principal Herald, um, check out your regionals. Um, try and get hold of them and see if they can help you. Uh, you can work through any of the members in the Garnet staff. Uh, several of them are listed in the at-large heralds uh, on the roster at aeheralds.net. Uh, you might uh, have some other uh, at-large heralds that uh, are local to you who might be able to meet with you face-to-face -face, uh, versus over email. Um, don't be afraid to copy the Garnet Herald or the Principal Herald on your correspondence. Um, the Principal Herald is going to forward it to the Garnet Herald anyway. Um, 
And that way, if you do have to come all the way to the top, at least we're caught up on uh, what the issues were that you were facing in the first place. Uh, last, no cash, personal check or money order. Um, and the personal check needs to be written by uh, the person who is submitting or their spouse or uh, parent legal guardian. So um, I am sorry that uh, that actually took a few minutes longer than my normal class, um, but I tend to get carried away when I don't uh, uh, have people raising hands and asking questions. Uh, and I uh, don't have a clock actually sitting in front of me telling me uh, how much time I'm using up. But I will encourage you to take a look at uh, some of the other uh, lectures that I've got in uh, this same uh, block of instruction. Um, if you're a consulting herald, I have a couple of videos on doing name consultations and doing armory consultations. Um, I will have a video posted uh, soon uh, regarding how uh, to do effective commentary in the Oscar system on internal and external letters of intent. And I hope uh, not too far in the future uh, to have a video on how to navigate Oscar uh, if you are fortunate enough uh, to be designated as a um, submissions herald. Uh, so with that, I will see you next time around.